We're hoping to bring home more than just one medal from SAVE this year. Um, thanks for sharing your kids with us. They're amazing people. We love who they are as individuals. We're proud to take them across the state and to all these meets. We know that, hands down, our students are the best students that we, yes, we see. Um, they're just really something to be proud of, regardless of how they speak. <laughs> I, the speaking helps, <laughs> but we love who they are. So um, we're going to start off with Katie and Holden's duet. Yes, we are. Okay. <laughs> nine years old, it became apparent to me that life was unfair. There were two main reasons for this. One, I didn't get the unicorn I wanted for Christmas. And two, August. Now, you may be thinking that I had a particularly bad August, and I did have a bad August. But the August I'm referring to here was the son of my mom's friend. He looked like this. Well, not exactly like this. Imagine him nine years old. And apparently he didn't have shins. August wasn't like any boy I had ever met. Stop that. He was funny and he was cute and he... That's not funny. Just go get ready. Finding love at any age is hard enough. Finding love as a clumsy nine-year-old is a whole new story. Follow these two as they ride the roller coaster of trial and tribulation in August, August and Anna, Anna by Don Zales. Anyway, during the summer between my third and fourth grade years, my mom dragged me over to her friend's house. And there, never gonna give you up, never gonna let you down, never gonna run around and hurt you, never gonna make you cry, never gonna say goodbye, never gonna <laughs> loser. Hey, come back here! What? What did you do that for? I don't know. I was bored. Well, it was rude. Would it help if I said I was sorry? Maybe a little. Okay. Hey, where are you going? What? You didn't say you were sorry. I know. I'm not supposed to tell lies. Would it help if I gave you a hug? Probably not. What if I give you one anyway? <laughs> Loser. Yeah, you better run, you big meanie! I am Taekwondo and I'll kick you in the stomach! <laughs> Hi, I'm August. Anna. I see you met my younger brother. Is he the person that just pushes people down for no reason whatsoever? Yeah, that sounds about like him. Yeah, I met him. Why does he do that? You know how some dogs are just mean and they'll bite you for no reason whatsoever? Yeah, that's about like him. It must be apocalyptic to live with him. What? Apocalyptic! It's an advanced vocabulary word. Huh. I haven't learned that one yet. My mother said I have the vocabulary of a slow 20-year-old. Wow. I know. Say, do you want to play some games? Okay. Let's see. No. What about guns? Okay. <laughs> I blew you up. No, you didn't. You missed me. I just fired a missile at you and blew you up. You disintegrated on disintegrated on contact. The impact of the missile has decimated your body. No, your body is des de des decimated. Yeah, that. Let's play something else. Fine. No. What about space death aliens? Do we get to be space death aliens? No. You're an alien, and I'm an alien hunter. Okay. Of interstellar space, 
to sow this corn and ruin on this puny planet. Bow before me, human scum, while I hey, shot you. No, that your bullets have no hope against me. But I, I shot you again. I have absorbed your bullets and transformed them into a source of renewable energy. Mmm, tasty. Soon this worthless speck of rock will serve alien masters. You're the weirdest girl I've ever met. I am not a girl. I am an evil. Oh, ow! Whoops! I hate you. <laughs> so <laughs> my first kiss didn't go exactly as planned. I couldn't help it though because my home life was kind of crazy. I was studying jujitsu. I had a purple belt in taekwondo. And my dad was teaching me a new martial art he invented himself, the just to show him. But I didn't really want to be a fighter. Well, maybe a little, but still. In my mind, my first kiss went something like this. Hello there. I was just riding my unicorn through the enchanted wood over there, and I must say, you are the most beautiful girl in the world. I am? Yes. In fact, let me get a coarse wood like creature to sing a song for you. Never gonna give you up, never gonna let you. Oh, they're adorable. Shall I get some birds to arrange your hair? That's okay. Oh, look, a rainbow. I love you, Anna. I love me too. <laughs> of course, now when I picture it, all I see is this. No! playing first-person fighting video games. I even let him win a couple of times. But the bliss wouldn't last. August moved to Canada. His parents were worried that the neighborhood was no longer safe. I was pretty inconsolable. I resolved to become a nun and swear off the world of men and first-person fighting video games for the rest of my life. First option was actually easier than the second. He ended up moving back in middle school. Hi, Agus. Hi, Anna. How's Canada? It was cold, really. <coughs> Very cold. That's kind of how I imagined it. So, you knocked one out recently? No. Hey, do you remember when we were nine? And you punched me in the gut and made me pee my pants? <laughs> You peed your pants. You didn't know that? That's gross. Oh, shut up. Right. Before and after the kiss, you know, we kind of... What? Liked each other. So, what I'm saying is... Yeah? Yeah? Does Polly have a boyfriend? <laughs> so, yeah. That was middle school. <laughs> Fast forward to high school, and we ended up going to prom together. May I have this dance? You want to be seen with me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Look, I'm sorry about middle school. Everyone's sorry about middle school. That's what makes a middle school. Yeah, but what I'm trying to say is, uh, I've had a crush on you for a long time. Really? Yeah. I think you're smart and funny and- You like that? Yeah. Oh my god. I bet you can become a lawyer, make lots of money, be able to support me. That'd be pretty cool. And I don't care that you're wearing a big, pink, fluffy dress to make you like Barbie and crazy. I still think you're beautiful. August, I... I broke into a cold sweat. My vision went blurry. My heart was racing. Me's weak arms were heavy. And then I realized it wasn't love. 
It was mom's spaghetti. <laughs> Something in it was going to kill me. August, I... What? <laughs> what? <laughs> Apparently it wasn't gluten-free. <laughs> <laughs> And it was way better than the first one because I didn't punch him afterwards. <laughs> it's kind of cliche to say, but we lived happily ever after. And I only broke his wrist once, but that was mostly an accident. Mostly. <laughs> between a young man and woman, until one day she finally escapes the horror of abuse. Sometimes when I was little, my dad and I would play hide and seek. I'd hide in the closet every time, and he'd act like he couldn't find me. I could always hear him walk back and forth in front of the closet door, calling out my name like he didn't already know where I was. He'd act surprised when he opened the closet door and found me crouched on the floor giggling to myself. There you are! He'd say with that jolly big grin on his face, Here I am! Daddy, how can you always find me? I'll always know where you are. Then he'd reach out with his rough but kind hands and pull me out from my hiding spot. I started dating Zach when I was 17. You know how they say how there's someone out there for everyone? Well, Zach was my someone. From his bright blue eyes to his intoxicating charm, Zach was everything that a girl could ever ask for. Not to mention he was our high school football team star quarterback. Nothing could beat the feeling of wearing his jersey to the football games every Friday night. Saturdays, we would go to whatever party was happening that weekend. He was that guy who was the life of the party. We'd walk in together, his arm around me, both smiling. I couldn't imagine being anyone's but his. Zach took me on countless dates to all of these places that I never would have gone to if it wasn't for him. I felt so lucky because I knew how great he was even when no one else was watching. <clears throat> but then he started to go to more 
and more parties. And this time, he went to these parties without me. There was no arm around my shoulder, just myself, sitting at home, waiting for someone who maybe wouldn't even come. That's where my love story turns around. He always told me how his father wasn't good to his mother and that his mother deserved better. He'd tell me stories about how he'd come home to his drunken father with his hands around his mother's neck and he'd have to pry them off of her. He often said how he had cuts and bruises, but that they were worth it. He told me these stories and every time <coughs> they'd end the same way with the, oh, I'm never gonna turn into my father speech. Before I knew it, he was turning in to the exact man he didn't want to be. He would show up at all hours of the night expecting me to take care of him. In the beginning, I took very good care of him, but eventually he was never satisfied. He stumbled through the door instantly mad at me with some made up story. He called me lazy, worthless, homely, stupid, and sometimes, sometimes, it, it didn't end there. It started small with a shove and a fist and he would just get lost in the violence. Of course, the next morning, he would feel terrible about it. He always did. He'd apologize and apologize and I forgave him many more times than I should have. My dad always told me that I deserved better than Zach. But it seemed like the good times made up for the bad times. Zach was such a good guy before all of this. And I know what you're thinking. Why am I still with him, right? The thing is, I wasn't prepared for what could happen to me if I tried to escape. You see, my mother left my dad when I was two. He always told me how the life she was living wasn't good for her and she just needed space. You could tell by the way he talked about her that he still loved her. But none of that really matters anymore, does it? My father passed away seven years ago after a long battle with cancer. He was the most courageous, bravest man I ever knew. My father is buried in the ground, but I needed him to come and rescue me. I needed him to come home, open these closet doors, and help me escape from this mess. But he couldn't. He couldn't rescue me this time. No, leave me alone! And he grabbed my arm so tight that I could feel the bruises forming in the shape of fingerprints as I fell. And he pulled me across the floor. I could feel the hardness of the old carpet against my bare leg as his grip led me to the closet. And he threw me against the wall and stay there. That way I'll always know where you are. And that was where I spent my night, in the locked closet. I remember thinking, maybe it's better this way. This way, he can't hurt me. I kept telling myself that. He can't hurt me. He can't hurt me. He can't hurt me. After the beating, he left me in the closet for days. On the first day, my head would not stop bleeding. So I tore off a piece of an old coat that 
press against the gash. I tore off another piece to wrap around my forearm where the baseball bat took its second hit, but the blood went through in minutes. Blood was everywhere, and I was forced to go to the bathroom in there because there was no way to get out. On the second day, and I could tell it was a new day because I could see the sunlight shining through the cracks of the door. I was starting to grow hungrier and hungrier. On the third day, I started to fade. I could no longer feel the blood against my bruised face. I could barely hear someone pacing outside of the door. I braced myself, but then the door opened. I squinted up through the bright light. Dad? Dad, here I am. How can you always find me? I'll always know where you are. love story with farming. <laughs> She's going to give his persuasive speech. I guess I didn't get this, the suit message, so. <laughs> and on the eighth day, God looked down on his plan paradise and said, I need a caretaker. So God made a farmer. God said, I need somebody willing to get up before dawn, milk cows, work all day in the fields, milk cows again, eat supper, then go to town and stay past midnight at a meeting of the school board. You may recognize this line from Paul Harvey's famous 1978 radio broadcast speech. Farming is the most important and yet least recognized industry in the world. The 2020 United States Census reports that 2.6 million people in our great country, including my family, a fourth generation family farm has been spraying, plowing, raking, disking, planting, and harvesting our, all, our ground all the way from Illinois to Lodgepole, Nebraska, the place where my great grandparents settled down to try to make a clean living by turning some dirt, and all while watching rain clouds and hoping that they would stay and deliver us some vital moisture. The deciding factor on whether or not we will be living the good life for the years to come. Farming is the most essential industry in the world. I have heard this in sowing ways in which farming, dem farming provides the world with means of survival, till up evidence demonstrating how farming restores critical habitats of the world, and harvesting ways in which farming is the driving factor for the industrialization of technology. It had to be somebody who plowed deep and straight, not cut corners, and who planting time and harvest season will finish his 40 hour week by Tuesday noon. Farming provides the world with means of survival. Who ate breakfast this morning? A bowl of cereal? A granola bar? A glass of orange juice? Or even a slice of bacon with eggs? These were all grown or raised by the men and women of agriculture. If it weren't for these 540 million brave souls around the world, we would never be able to eat. Case in point, Nebraska alone produces 179 billion bushels of corn per year, according to the World Population Review, accessed December 9th, 2021. In the article, Change the Way You Think About Food, on worldwildlife.org, we learned that farmers generate $1.3 trillion worth of food annually. Without this dedication, our world would have faced food shortages years ago. And looking forward to how farmers will carry us into the future, we are faced with an unavoidable equation. The world's population times consumption equals the globe's carrying capacity. Stephanie Bradley explains in her September 2021 article that only one third of our planet is able to produce food. And by 2050, 
we will need to produce twice this amount to support sustainability. This proves that the world's survival falls upon the shoulders of the undervalued farmer. God said I need somebody willing to sit up all night with a newborn colt and watch it die and then dry his eyes and say maybe next year. The act of farming restores critical <coughs> habitat to the world. Author Daniel Vernick's article, published November 2020, recognizes when farmers replace chemical fertilizers with plant compost and animal manure, therefore strengthening soil fertility. This shift reduces erosion, improves soil fertility, and even functions as a natural form of pest control. Other methods are addressed in the same article, called intercropping, or planting different crops between rows of plants, such as corn with squash. This practice reduces erosion, improves soil fertility, and even functions as a natural form of pest control by providing shade and shelter for creatures. It also promotes biodiversity. And importantly, the second crop provides it farmers with an additional source of income. Sustainable agriculture is evidenced, again, in a study in 2011 at the University of California, Davis. By using hedge grows along field edges or ground covers between rows, therefore providing habitat for a multitude of species. By planting more diverse blends of crops that can fuse or deflect pests. Lastly, World Wildlife reports that pasture and cropland occupy 50, around 50% 50 of the world's habitable land and provide food and habitat for a multitude of species. When agriculture operations are sustainably managed, they can improve, they can preserve and restore critical habitats, help protect watersheds, and improve soil health and water quality. God had to have somebody willing to ride the ruts at double speed. Farmers are industrious and are paving new technologies for the future. In 2018, agritech startups raised $16.9 billion, according to Iris Herman's article accessed on strategybusiness.com. In her article titled, The Fourth Industrial Revolution of Agriculture, farmers are using artificial intelligence called bovine facial recognition technology, which identifies each cow in a herd in seconds based upon facial features and hide patterns. Linked to machine learning software, it learns from what it sees and begins to automate more of the animal's daily care and can determine whether a cow is not eating or drinking enough or if she's sick and can alert the farmer via smartphone app. Over time, the platform learns from what it sees and begins to automate more of the animal's daily care. A big name in the farming industry, Cargill, was at the spearhead of technology when they helped to develop an open source blockchain solution which helped to provide reusable digital tools for supply chain cases, including food safety and traceability. For agriculture, this means big advances in precision farming, as indicated by John Deere's recent agritech, or recent agritech startup, Blue River Technology, as cited in KnowledgeWorks.org 2017 article from farm to table across four industrial revolutions. Farmers can keep track of their crops progress via drones and care for their plants with robotic sprayers. Now that we've sown ways in which farming provides the world with means of survival, tilled up evidence demonstrating how farming restores critical habitats of the world and harvested ways in which farming is the driving factor for the industrialization of technology it's obvious that farming is the most important industry in the world. While their demeanors may be modest, the impact on our world is blazing. Our world will not be the same without them, so God be the farm. Katie Eckhart is next to give us a little glimpse into her Monday mornings. Monday, 
7.30. 7.30? Oh my gosh, not good. But it's okay. We can still make it. It's doable, but we definitely have to get moving. We have to be in work in 30 minutes, so there is no time for breakfast. We'll just hop in the shower, throw some clothes on, and go. <gasps> Impossible! If we can leave in 15 minutes or less, we can still drive to work carefully, obey all traffic laws, and post its speed limits. <laughs> Yay! If I may, I have a counter proposal. Sweet and salty, black and white, hot and cold. They say opposites attract. The case is true for Sarah, as she is stuck between the angel and the devil on her shoulders, guiding her through every Monday morning by Scott Hahn. No, 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 you go away. We are being a good employee and a good person, and we are getting to work on time today. Right, yeah, we could totally do that. <laughs> or we could stay in bed a little longer, just throwing that out there. If we stay in bed, we'll be late for work. Only a little. We can get 10 more minutes of shut-eye and still do the quick breakfast, no shower, blah, 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 garbage, yella yapping about. And we'll be like 10 minutes late, 15 tops. Don't listen to her, Sarah. You're just a little sleepy. How about we get some coffee in you? You're a better and more responsible person after caffeine. We have time for that. Sarah. Isn't this the most comfortable blanket ever? It's like a cocoon of your happiness. What is that? Polar fleas? Mmm, so warm and toasty. I prefer very warm temperatures myself. Listen, you, we only get 10 tardies a year before this disciplinary action, like losing a bonus or getting fired or a stern warning from our boss. We've already used up five thanks to you, and it's only February. If we're late again, that will be six. Is that what you want? Are you trying to get us in trouble? Mm, maybe. Sounds like fun. Can I bring my pitchfork? You know what? You're right. I'm sorry. We don't have a lot of tawnies to spare, and it's best that we don't use up another one too soon. Thank you. It's refreshing to see that every once in a while, logic actually works on you. It's true, we need to protect those toddies. However, it's only a toddy if we're one 30 minutes late. Anything over that counts as a partial sick day. And we have a lot more of those to spare. Wait, wait, no, hang on. Yes, so in this case, we need to be more than half an hour late, so we use a quarter of our sick day instead. Good thinking, you're so smart. No, don't let that down. No, you do not put this on me. Why, thank you. <laughs> it's nice of you to give me all the credit. Oh, yeah. Pull that up there. <laughs> that <a> girl. <laughs> this, this is probably you not. But look at that smile. How could something that brings her so much joy truly be wrong? <laughs> look, just chill out. We'll be an hour late. No big deal. <gasps> so it's a whole hour now. Wait. We have that teleconference at 9 o'clock today! Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. And we haven't even prepared for it yet. We still have to review last week's meetings notes and research sales data and, oh, dumb drops. We have to get there at 8. Now there's not time for breakfast or a shower. Unless, no, let's be realistic. If we get there at 8 and that was not enough time to do all that research before the meeting, do we really want to go in unprepared? <sighs> that would be a disaster. Stop it! At this point, it would just be irresponsible to attend a meeting we're not ready for. So it's best if we're just not on that call. <laughs> I hate to even ask, but what are you suggesting? <gasps> we got about two hours late, okay? Two hours. Meeting will be over but we'll only use a quarter of a sick day. That gives us plenty of time to get a little more sleep, have breakfast, shower, check out Facebook, and still drive to work while fully obeying all the stupid traffic laws. 
Great. And how are we supposed to explain why we're two hours late? I don't know. Flat tire, alien invasion, attacked by rabid wombats? <laughs> Tell you what, let's sleep on it. I don't believe this. We're going to get in big trouble. Those meetings are mandatory, you know. This is wrong. It's less than two hours, okay, goody two shoes. It's not a big deal. Can't you ever just take a day off? Can't I ever show up, be the voice of reason, and not have you arguing with everything I say? No. Psh, how boring would that be? You need me for balance. We are yin and yang. Actually, the first word is yin, not yang. There's no G, it's yin and yang. See? This is why Sarah needs me. You are so perfect and annoying. If you were controlling Sarah all the time, everybody would hate her guts. You know, I'm tired of cleaning up your messes. When we get to the office today, we're going to have to explain to Mr. Warren why he missed the teleconference. It's I, for one, and not looking forward to that. Um, don't sweat it. <laughs> We won't need to do that. And why not? Because we're calling it sick for the whole day, so we won't see him again until tomorrow. But if we... Wait, what? Did you say out all day? Of course. <sighs> Try to keep up, will you? <laughs> so now we're not even working today, oh! When did this happen? Listen, just trust me. If we're... <sighs> sick. We'll get everybody else in the office sick, and that would be just cruel. What right do we have to risk the health and the safety of every person who works there? Well, none. If we were actually sick, what's the matter with you? Absolutely nothing. I just don't think the weekend needs to end quite this soon. That's all. You are infuriating, you know that? I wish I could use my angel wings to fly far away from you, but no. Someone chopped them off while I was sleeping. <laughs> yeah, good times. All right, that's enough. I'm tired of your irresponsible nonsense. Sarah, stand up. Sarah does need to get up. Yes, she does. So she can call in sick. No, no call. We are getting dressed. We are going to work. We are doing the right thing, the adult thing. Look at you. You are really putting your foot down on this one. You are. Me what? Do I'm sorry, I don't mean to stare, it's just you have this glow I've never seen before. It's like, wait, take a few steps back. Back? <laughs> like this way? Yeah, just a little more. Whoa, stop right there. Wow, the way the light is hitting you, it's so luminescent. You look amazing. I mean, literally heavenly. Really? I think that's the first compliment you've ever made. Really? Shh. There, there. Don't struggle. Let it go! You make your phone call, Sarah. I'll shut this one up for a minute. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Warren. Hi, this is... <coughs> this is Sarah. Listen, I hate to do this to you, but I'm feeling just... just miserable today. And whatever I have is... Well, it's super nasty. N no, of course I didn't forget about the meeting. But I'm more concerned about getting Linda sick. She's eight months pregnant now, so there's a health and unborn baby to consider. Oh, what nice touch. <laughs> yes, I agree. It's the right thing to do. Yep. <coughs> Sorry again. Yep, bye-bye. Man, now was that so bad? You, you, me what? Go on, say it. Let it out. You, you sneaky little rascal! <laughs> I'm sorry. I did not want to use language like that, but you throw me to it. Yeah, you are right on the edge, you bloody mouth. <laughs> I know, and I'll have to find a way to live myself. But I better get away from you first, so I can calm down. <laughs> Excuse me. So now that we have the whole day free, what can we do? What to do, what to do. Oh, I got it! We can set the landlord's car on fire! <laughs>
himself to Sundays, and then um, after a few minutes of our sweets, we'll get back to Sunday. <laughs>
give us his informative speech that he will be convening in a couple days. <laughs> What do you think of when you hear the word hacker? Someone sitting in a hoodie in a dark room with multiple screens in front of them, lines of code running down the screen? In this case, you're probably thinking of a hacker. Or at least the stereotype of them. Hacking has been around since the early 1970s, starting with free phone calls, according to UFL.edu. The Cambridge Dictionary, accessed December 8, 2021, defines hacking as the gaining of unauthorized access to the data in a system or computer, or to spread a virus. Remember that time that you got to your parents' computer without their knowledge? That was technically hacking, accessing someone else's computer without their permission. Hacking is a broad and relevant topic in today's world. So today, we are going to decrypt the reasons for hacking, brute force some well-known hacks, and fish up what you can do to protect yourself from hackers. Grab your mouse, and let's decrypt why hackers hack. Platforms such as Facebook track and store user data. This data is stored somewhere, otherwise sites like Facebook, Google, and Amazon couldn't target us with ads. Speaking of ads, today's speech is brought to you by Grammarly. Writing speeches is tough. That's why Grammarly is here to help. <laughs> the fact that this data is stored somewhere at all means that if someone were to get access to that server, they can use that data for anything they want, malicious or not. A few negative motivations for hacking are identity theft, stealing credit card numbers, and ransomware. This last one is fresh in our memories, as ransomware hackers recently gained access into the servers of Colonial Python Company. In an article written by William Turton and Cardicam Rotra on Bloomberg.com on June 4, 2021, $4.4 million were given to the hackers in order to reestablish the largest fuel pipeline in the East and end the massive shortages. On the flip side of the Bitcoin, sometimes a hacker decides to hack just for the challenge. Kevin Mitnick is one of the most well-known hackers of all time. According to Kapersky.com, he once gained complete access to the servers of the telephone company, Pacific Bell, only to prove that he could. He didn't do anything at all with the information he now had access to. Hacking can also have positive intentions, such as to secure information. Companies will often pay people, known as white hat hackers, to attempt to gain access into the company's systems. The hacker attempts to gain access, then tells the company how it worked and what to fix. Sometimes, this leads to breakthroughs in technology. In fact, the main reason that most of our data is safe nowadays is because people needed more secure methods to prevent hackers from doing their thing. Stretch out your fingers, because it's time to brute force some newsworthy hacks. One of the most well-known hacks of all time is the Rocky data breach. The file stolen contains over 14 million unique passwords used in over 32 million unique accounts. It was obtained when the app developing company, known as Rocky, had a massive data breach and made the mistake of not encrypting any of the user's data, even after having been previously hacked. This next hack probably affected you or someone you know. An April 3, 2021 article written by Aaron Holmes of Insider.com reports the personal information of 553 million Facebook users worldwide was stolen and leaked. This meant the full names, email addresses, birth dates, phone numbers, and bios were all available to anyone on the internet. In summer of 2021, a major streaming platform known as Twitch was entirely compromised. Everything from the source code of the platform, to user passwords and stream keys, to even how much money top streamers made in the last year was available for anyone to view. But not all famous hacks were this recent. During World War II, the German army sent encrypted messages through the Enigma machine. This machine was very similar in build to a typewriter, although a bit more complex. It allowed a user to input a message, then displayed a different message depending on its configuration. According to Brilliant.org, this simple device had over 160 quintillion possible combinations. Yes, that is a 16 followed by 19 zeros. 
The British intelligence agencies spearheaded a mission to crack this machine. They were successful, and this key break helped lead to Allied victory. Dig out your fishing poles, because it's time to fish up some ways to protect yourself from the hackers. According to Norton LifeLock, phishing is a cybercrime in which scammers try to lure sensitive information or data from you by disguising themselves as a trustworthy source. As stated in their September 2021 article, what is phishing, how to recognize and avoid phishing scams? For starters, don't reuse old passwords. While I know how tempting it can be to use that same password you've had since you were in high school, if a hacker ever gets access to that one password, they can use that password for anything you use that for. Secondly, don't click on links from unknown sources. <coughs> According to purplesec.us, accessed June 23, 2021, by the end of 2017, the average user was receiving 16 emails a month with a malware link. When clicked, these links would download software, often without the user knowing, to the device and then act. This can be anything from spyware, which steals your information, to ransomware, which locks down your device and then asks for money. And don't even get me started on antiviruses. For starters, they slow down the user's system. A lot. Secondly, they are intrusive. They have their sneaky little hands in every part of the user's system in order to better protect you. And yes, while they might be able to protect you in a few cases here and there, if that antivirus is ever compromised, a hacker now has more access than they would ever be able to get normally, according to TrueVault.com. The deep dark world of hacking has started to come into the light. Now that we've decrypted the reasons for hacking, brute forced some well-known hacks, and fished up what you can do to protect yourself from hackers. Having an online footprint is inevitable in today's world. The role of technology in our everyday lives forces us to acknowledge hacking as a permanent fixture in society. Knowing how to protect yourself and be aware of the risks and benefits of hacking can make all of us a more responsible digital citizens. We are taught from the moment we leave our pink nurseries, we are collapsible paper dolls. Light to hold, easier to crumble. That as women, our worth lives secretly wrapped in lace and cotton panties. Our fragility armored in pepper spray and mace. Modern womanhood is hard to define, but consistently, we agree on the description of the struggle. Women of all shapes, sizes, and color have been subjected to the wrath of society's viewpoint on how women should act, what box we should fit in and stay in. During this program, three authors defy the notion that women are fragile pets and give strength to the powerful voices inside How to Cure a Feminist by Kate Rokowski, Paper Dolls by Sierra de Mulder, and Pocket Sized Feminism by Blythe Bayer. Ever find a pretty little lady at the bar? The type of look that just screams of arm candy? The type of skin that longs to be unzipped? Only to find out that she's an empowered woman? Mm -hmm. Well, look no longer, man friend. Just follow these simple steps to cure your feminist. The only other girl at the party is ranting about feminism. Her audience, a sea of rape jokes and snapbacks and styrofoam cups, and me. They gawk at her mouth like it is a drain clogged with too many opinions. I shoot her an empathetic glance, 
and say nothing. Step one, open her eyes. Example, replace the word tips with the word equality and resume normal conversation. I love equality. I wish women didn't have to hide their equality. You weren't just violated, we tell her. You are an empty museum, a gutted monument to what used to hold so much worth. With best intentions, we tell her to reclaim it. Put a price tag on her rape and own it. Step two, open her eyes. Girls are basically designed to be brainwashed. It's how they became feminists in the first place. Too many strong-willed women in the past or something. Reverse this nasty little habit with subliminal messaging. Example, place a tube of lipstick in your medicine cabinet. She will soon feel inadequate to the woman you are presumably cheating on her with. This will convince her, nay, force her into acting like a more civilized, submissive girl. This house is for wallpaper women. What good is wallpaper that speaks? I want to stand up, but if I do, Whose coffee table silence will these boys rest their feet on? I want to stand up. But if I do, what if the world notices I've been sitting this whole time? We are calling it theft, as if he could pluck open your ribs like cello strings, steal what makes your heart flutter, and tack its wings to his wall. Some days you will feel dirty. Some weeks you'll remember how hard it is to breathe in public, but know this. The person who did this to you is broken, not you. The person who did this to you is out there choking on the glass of his chest. It is a windshield and his heartbeat is a baseball bat. Regret this, regret this. Step three, treat her right. Now, let's not get crazy here. You don't actually have to treat her right. But if you buy her things while you quietly undermine her Ford Exploring combat boots, she will begin to think of this as a positive reinforcement. Soon, when you insult her, she will ask you to pick up the check. Step four, put her on a diet of cigarettes and hairspray until her waist is an apple core. Tell her she has never looked more ravishing. Step five, buy a trophy case. You will need a place to store her pelvic bone and the pre notch bedpost. Once an adult man made a necklace out of his hands for me, and I still wake up in hot sweats, haunted with the images of the hurt of girls he assaulted after I didn't report. How am I to forgive myself for doing nothing in the mouth of trauma? Is silence not an act of violence too? Step six, show her what you are capable of. Come home covered in another man's blood, dragging a chunk of his muscle in your mouth and make her clean up the mess. Step seven, Give her a new name. First, whisper it in the crooks of her neck until her muscles have committed it to memory, then shout it in the belly of her bedroom until the echo haunts her in her sleep. Don't stand too tall, don't act too strong. We will name you Denial. Come back when your bones are ready to crumble like they are made of chalk. Nothing was stolen from you. Your body is not a hand-me-down. There is nothing in you holding your worth. No locket that can be seen or touched, plucked from your stomach to be left on the concrete. I know it's hard to feel perfect when you can't tell an Adam's apple from a fist. Some ashtray of a man picked you to play his Eden, but I will not watch you collapse. We are surrounded by boys who hang up our naked posters and fantasize about choking us. 
We are the daughters of men who warned us of the news and the sharp edges of the world. They begged us to be careful, to be safe, then told our brothers to go out and play. Finally, scratch into her back while you love her. It is proof that nothing is sacred, that no backbone is too straight to be snapped into submission, that every layer of skin can be clawed off. Nothing before this mattered. She never even existed without you. Ethan up to entertain you with a not so entertaining subject. A hostage situation? Affirmative, a host. Eight minutes. But well, as long as hostage, that's his real name, is psychologist down to rewrite the theories of negotiation, starting with famous negotiators. And slow method of talking for moms turning 30. <laughs> everyone, you're listening to 96.3 The Negotiator. We have way across the sky. What's good? What you want? Oh, wait, no road too long. We <laughs> the FBI, and I had to deal with a negotiator talking to me like her. The next technique to utilize is the mirror. It involves listening to a search that the most effective method is. Then, Kate, we're ready to come in yet. You need no shooting us. Excuse me? Fine. Good luck getting hostages back. You can only imagine that the outcome was nothing but positive <laughs> situations from history. Of D.B. Kirk got fed up with being called a slime hijacker what they wanted, and this time was no plane had taken back on the face of the earth. Something was in the cargo hold that only reemerged serious situation. You may or may not have heard of this on the news, but let me paint a picture. Serial kidnapper by the name of Philip Schultz. Still, we're gonna move. Honey, she's already urban. That's cool. wonder what you taste like? We all have our own distinct smell, appearance, and voice, but do we have our own flavor too? A group of athletes had this same question. In July of 2016, they had the opportunity to consume the amputated foot of a friend. The foot tacos allowed them to indulge their curiosity one toe at a time. 
The topic of cannibalism is often stereotyped as abnormal. However, it is rich in history and culture. Cannibalism is a mouthful. So let's take a bite out of the history of cannibalism, chew on the different motivations of cannibalism, and digest the effects of cannibalism. In our first bite of cannibalism history, a 19th century French work titled The Collection of Historians from the Crusades tells the story of the crusade of 1096. It holds the first recorded account of cannibalism, though they did not yet have the term. Christian soldiers attacked the Syrian capital of Mara and ate the flesh of local Muslims. English society was repulsed by the soldiers' actions, and in order to keep the public happy, the Catholic Church changed its religious practices to officially exclude cannibalism. The term cannibal was coined 400 years later by Christopher Columbus, as recounted by Stephanie Livingston in her March 2015 article on the Florida Science Museum website. Columbus described the indigenous people of Guadalupe as peaceful and friendly, with the exception of the Caribs, who were known to eat the flesh of their prisoners. Queen Isabella gave Columbus permission to arrest the group. He used the word cannibal for those who resisted, though now the term is used for anyone who consumes human flesh. In ancient times, cannibalism was practiced all over, so why did it become taboo? While there is no definite answer, the most commonly agreed to is a myriad of factors. The increase of life expectancy, an increase in interpersonal relations, religious practices and views, and legal restrictions. The Age of Enlightenment brought many discoveries across the field of medicine, the biggest known as classification. It allowed doctors to determine and treat a patient's ailment more efficiently. This led to an increase of life expectancy. An increase in life expectancy led to an increase in interpersonal relations. With more time on Earth, people were able to forge stronger bonds and more intimate relationships. It was now unethical to eat your best friend. Cannibalism has never been outlawed within a written legal document. However, there are 23 countries where cannibalism is common law illegal, including the United States and Canada. To coincide, there are nine places in the world where cannibalism is part of everyday life, including Papua New Guinea, the Ganges River in India, Cambodia, Rotenburg, Germany, and Miami, Florida. After taking a bite out of the history, it's time to chew on the different motivations of cannibalism. Eat today or die tomorrow is one of the most extreme quandaries of human survival and it is displayed in the Donner Party's engagement of survival cannibalism. Michael Wallace, author of What Would You Do?, tells the story of the Donner Party during his June 17, 2017 interview on National Public Radio. In May of 1846, the Donner brothers decided to lead a group of emigrants from Illinois to California. That year, winter came early and trapped them in freezing cold temperatures. They quickly ran out of provisions and escalated from eating oxen, horses, and dogs to pine cones and tree bark. Finally, they were desperate and in order to survive, began eating companions that had passed from starvation or hypothermia. Ritualistic cannibalism is practiced all over the world in many different cultures. In her 1995 ethnologist journal, Thus Are Our Bodies, Thus Was Our Custom, Beth A. Conklin relates the ritualistic practice of the Wari of the Brazilian Amazon. The Wari used ritualistic cannibalism in their funeral rites until the 1960s. They believed the body was where personality and individuality resided. They used cannibalism as a way to transform the memories of their dead relatives into their own. As reported by the National Crime Museum's April 17, 2017 article, Serial cannibalism became well known with the case of Jeffrey Dahmer. In 1990, he began a ritual of raping and dismembering his victims, taking body parts such as skulls and genitalia to display and saving the rest for consumption. Between 1978 and 1991, Dahmer killed 17 males. Rape, dismemberment, necrophilia, and cannibalism were all parts of his modus operandi. Autocannibalism is outlined in an article published by Alicia Lockett on May 18, 2019. 
Autocannibalism is a mental health condition characterized by the practice of eating parts of oneself, such as skin, nails, and hair. Autocannibalism is often associated with other underlying conditions, such as obsessive compulsive disorder and anxiety. Autocannibalism can be detrimental to one's physical health, especially when paired with allotriophagia, the desire to eat inappropriate foods or non-nutritive substances. Adverse but medicinal cannibalism has been studied for centuries. Adverse by biology professor Bill Schutt's TED Talk on July 25, 2019, Europeans of the 16th century began using medicinal cannibalism after the discovery of mummia. Mummia was made by grinding up mummified human flesh. They used this for most medical ailments, including epilepsy, hemorrhaging, bruising, and nausea. Europeans also used blood in either liquid or powdered form, <coughs> liver, gallstones, oil distilled from human brains, and pulverized hearts. Causing awkwardness at Thanksgiving dinner isn't the only effect of cannibalism to be digested. As reported by the National Institute of Neurological Disorders webpage, last updated on May 28, 2020, Kubru is the number one side effect of cannibalism. Kubru is a rare, fatal degenerative brain disease spread from the dead to the living by the consumption of flesh. The only reported cases of the disease occurred during the 1950s and 60s among the four people of Papua New Guinea. They viewed cannibalism as a sign of love and respect. However, the brain tissue of the deceased was highly infectious. Kuru belongs to a class of infectious diseases called transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, TSEs, in which the hallmark is distorted protein molecules that clump together and accumulate in brain tissue. Kuru had a long incubation period. It was typically years before an infected person showed symptoms. The disease attacked the cerebellum, the part of the brain responsible for coordination. Because of this, initial indicators were an unsteady walk, tremors, and slurred speech. The four people named the disease after these traits. Kuru is the four word for shiver. After having time to marinate on the abnormal practice of cannibalism, it is obviously a mouthful. We have taken bites of cannibalism through the ages, chewed on the different motivations of cannibalism, and digested the effects of cannibalism. By creating a better understanding of human behavior, we all become a little more human ourselves. And while I don't expect to take up the practice of cannibalism, I no longer carry around the stereotypes that are associated with it. That's our night. Thank you so much for coming and thanks for all of your support. Thank you. Ms. Craig. No, it's just me. I just need you. Are you getting suckered into something else? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Thank you for barbecue. Are you getting suckered into something else? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>